the topics that we cover in this particular series are the ones which are appearing in daily newspapers how they can be beneficial for you to increase your knowledge plus understand the topic and use these in any answer or any discussions or any other interview back with topics number 1 is special 301 report and what about the effect of it on india and us relations how it is going to affect the economic ties between two countries then comes the second that is judiciary on child care there was a verdict recently about child care and women uh, contribution to it third is the payment fraud rise so payment frauds actually which are happening either through digital channels etc is on the rise we will we will also you know learn with it then comes campus protest in the usa you now understand that or you know that there is a campus protest actually regarding palestinians is going on currently in the several us universities is it a part of academic freedom or certain a larger design we will understand with it then comes supreme court decision about njac supreme court in its petition says no to the njac we will deal with it now comes the first one a special 301 report so a special 301 report in india has been put against on the priority watch list for the intellectual property rights issue so united states has once again included india in the priority watch list of countries along with china russia venezuela and other countries and what is the issue so alleged problems related to intellectual property rights protection and enforcement us further says that there will be particular intense bilateral engagement on the matter during the coming year so the office this 301 report is prepared by the office of united states trade representative that is called usdr it released its 301 report on the adequacy and effectiveness of us trading rights partners protection and enforcement of protection intellectual property rights when we talk about the report highlights progress made by the trading partners of the us a special 301 re re review was also done so when we talk about the background of this report so this report is an annual review of the global state of ip protection and enforcement <laughs> us trade representatives conducts this review pursuant to section 182 of the trade act of 1974 as amended by the omnibus trade and competitiveness act of 1988 and uruguay round agreement act so this year's report trading partners of priority watch list present the most significant concerns this year regarding insufficient ip protection or enforcement or action that otherwise limit market access for persons relying on the intellectual property protection india actually has been in included in this list these include online enforcement of intellectual property high rates of online piracy an extensive trademark opposition backlog and insufficient legal means to protect trade secrets so these are the concerns among other things india still needs to fully implement the wipo internet treaties and ensure that copyright statutory license do not extend to the interactive transmissions when we talk about india as a stance new delhi has however maintained that its intellectual property laws are in strict adherence to the world trade organizations trade related intellectual property rights that is called trips agreement and it is not bound by any global rules to make changes in its laws no action is threatened by the us against countries on the priority watch list but if a country actually is made a part of the special 301 report priority watch list and it categorized as a priority country usa may impose retaliatory measures indonesia chile and argentina are other countries on the priority watch list 20 trading partners are on the watch list including countries that the us believes merit bilateral attention to address underlying ip problems but are better than priority watch list countries so when we talk about the priority watch list countries how it can affect the economic ties between india and us when india is put on the priority watch list it means usa is feeling that india is not providing adequate protection to the ip of us companies or us organizations 
so whenever a new company of the us is coming to india it will be reading the 301 report suppose that some company wants to plan its uh, uh, investment in our country then it will be also going through the 301 report and if it finds that there are certain issues then that report contains all those problems then maybe actually that investment may not be coming to india or if that investment is still supposed to come then the bargain with the indian government will be harder because already you are in the priority watch list of that country second also suppose a us sells arms to india and wants that you know the arms require certain intellectual property pro uh, protection and if us feels that if the protection is not adequate it can refuse you know the trade of those weapons as well so these are the concerns another concern may be that it can done a retaliatory measure that it will implement the same set of sanctions actually against all those sectors where the ip or the alleged ip protection is supposedly taking place so that can be another concern but although india follows the world trade organizations united uh, sorry trips agreement so it is not bound by the us agreement as of now but when we talk about bilateral relations there can be some challenges in the bilateral format we now move on to the second topic and that is called collective responsibility and supreme court verdict on the child care opens up possibilities for women when we talk about this particular problem so the child care is a definite issue between uh, the societal framework and the women folks those are working in organizations as you know the women are entitled for 2 years of child care leave for two children till they reach the age of 18 years so what is the issue so the issue is uh, on monday the supreme court bench that was led by justice deva chandrachur said that participation of women in the workforce is a matter not just of a privilege but as a constitutional entitlement under the article 15 the state as a model employer cannot be oblivious to the special concerns which arise in the case of women who are part of the workforce so this is the situation article 15 actually does not allow any kind of discrimination among women based on these kind of things so they said that the state should rather actually you know work as a model uh, employer regarding it so the judgment comes at a time when concerns about the low participation rate of women in the workforce have been expressed in various circles and state and central governments and acknowledge the need for child care services to bolster the women participation in the workforce i would again tell you that women government sorry women employees actually are uh, movement government employees are eligible for 2 years of ccl for two children till the age till they reach the age of 18 years in india women have little choice but to single handedly manage the triple burden of household work care work and paid work as per the times you survey of india in 2019 indian men spent only 173 minutes compared to 433 minutes spent by women daily on unpaid domestic and care work and when the ratio is such a gigantic in favor of men then actually you know the unpaid domestic and care work socially and economically marginalized women are more stretched working women often face marriage penalties and motherhood penalties in the sense that once they get married if they are in the job also then maybe the jobs actually will be relinquished and if they are not in the job at least in the times of you know parental or uh, sorry maternal leaves etc then also can be a trouble for women career growth so that's why they are going through the marriage penalties and motherhood penalties which are often temporarily forced to withdraw from the workforce due to marriage and pregnancy that's why it is no surprise that female workforce participation in india is barely 37% 60% women are self employed and 53% of the self employed women work as unpaid family helpers these are intertwined outcome items or lack of opportunities in the labor market and opting for flexible employment near or at home 
the constitution enables the state to make special provisions for women and children so the sectoral labor laws that were repealed recently you see labor laws were repealed recently in favor of introduction of the labor codes they mandate that child care services on work sites and paid maternity leaves for a section of workers at a construction site bd cigarette and other factories plantation and migrants these laws mandated crashes on the work site that had a stipulated number of women on the workforce the provisions these provisions actually went through a transformation under the labor code on social protection of 2020 where crashes were made a gender neutral entitlement and it was seen as a significant direction of the women fox empowerment the gender neutral provision underlined care as a parental responsibility also however the entitlement limited to those organizations which had greater than 50 women workforce or employees this leaves out a large number of women who are part of the informal production workforce we also you know have this crash facility or grant in aid welfare program national crash scheme that is remaining underfunded and limited number of use and participation is there mission shakti project and under it ministry of women and child development had introduced a scheme called palna it provides option to the state government to open stand alone crashes or turn anganwadi centers into crashes the state governments of haryana karnataka odisha and assam have started taking initiatives many states are trying to introduce anganwadi center crashes these endeavors are worth celebrating however there is a need to institutionalize the initiative with a committed budget that's why to reach the highest potential of women workforce we require these kind of changes and the crash facility or the child care facility have to be more institutionalized so the women workforce can be made more empowered then comes third one that is payment fraud rising by 70% to 2600 400 crore rupees as you must understand the digital economy is growing leaps and bounds it is a it is a upi transaction that is taking the not only the convenience but comfort at home and allowing you know the merchants and the citizens to make payment among themselves so it has opened the door for the limited limitless possibilities it has caused the growth of the startup industry as well you see that you know the person who is sitting at the last or the remotest corner of the country can also sell and buy the goods with a click of a button so with the rise of the penetration of internet and you know almost like 48% people is still accessing internet in our country so the rise of these digital in economy has been on a wonderful pace but payment frauds are also rising sharply the rbi data is saying so so the domestic payments fraud jumped by 70% to 2600 crore rupees in the 6 months period between march Uh, sorry the six month period between october 2024 2023 and march 2024 it was 1526 crore rupees earlier now it is standing at 2604 crore rupees the volume of the fraud has actually increased to 15 lakh that was 11 and 1/2 lakh rupees in the last six months so the volume of the digital fraud is close to 15 lakh with the money around 2604 crore so you can also always mention this data in your answers while rbi is considered only domestic financial transactions the new format captures e-commerce transaction as well transactions using fast tag digital bill payments and card to card transfer through atms etc are now under the picture failed transactions charge backs reversal expired cards wallets are still excluded so data on domestic payment fraud statistics is as reported by the scheduled commercial banks non banks ppi issuers and non bank credit card issuers in the central payment fraud information registry so 2.57 lakh payment frauds involving 471 crore rupees was done in march alone while 2.53 lakh frauds so of 503 crore rupees was in february alone so frauds lead to reputational operational and business risks for the banks and undermine customers trust in the banking system with financial stability implications so whenever you are writing about the banking frauds you should also mention that digital frauds or payments frauds are not only frauds in the simple terms that the money is lost but it's a reputational it's a business risk for the banks 
it causes actually you know erosion of the trust in the financial or banking system of the country and despite tough regulations and improved technological is technology scamsters are finding new routes to game the system that's why this is important for us to control the average amount of involvement in the frauds declined by 85 percent during april september of 2023 with the number of frauds rising sharply by 624 percent in the card and internet segment based on the date of reporting so another concern is the reporting itself how much reporting it is being done is also a limited issue so it also limits you know the amount of fraud that is being shown in the correct numbers or in the if in the formal or official numbers so we have to create mechanisms where the technology help is taken or where the scamsters are given penalty or uh, i mean uh, legal penalties that's why they get disgraced to do these kind of tasks then comes from 1960s to present a short story of the campus protest in the US. Why this topic? Because US is currently, many of the US universities are right now rising in the anti-Semitic protest or pro-Palestinian protests in the USA. When we talk about the university protest, there are two views of it. Those students in the universities, when they protest in the campus, it is termed as a academic independence or thought of the students themselves so number one academic freedom in the u.s in the in the universities actually is expressed through the protest so those who are in favor of the protest at the student side or at the university side talk about like that they even also saw that they even actually also see it just like as a major uh, hallmark of the democratic framework in the country or the diversity of the democracy in a country where the universities are not controlled by one section of the society. So there is a thought of expression, thought of belief that is propagated through universities. When people say that, you know, if the protests in universities are allowed non-stop or without any kind of hindrances, then there are fight among the thought process itself or ideologies. And when there is a fight or, or when there is a constant debate on the ideologies, then those ideologies which are superior will rise above and will be beneficial for the society and the country at large. So these are the prawns where, or these are the benefits actually where people say that, you know, even the protests in the universities are occurring, we, do, we should not worry. But there are those sections of the society or those analysts, they say that it is a dangerous precedent. Because suppose say today it is happening in one university, it can happen to another university as well. Number two, they say that in the name of freedom of expression, they certain time cross their boundaries. It can be a protest, say, of sit-in, but violent protest actually should not mark these kind of things. They also talk about that many of the ideologies actually that are in the background and do not have any kind of things to do with the country, they are now raising their heads through universities. And especially they talk about the left, left liberal or very, very ultra left liberal ideologies that may not have place in the mainstream of the society, but find an expression through these institutions. Even those actually who criticize the university's uh, protest also, they say that the business groups, those are somehow, you know, giving the uh, uh, funding or donation to these organizations and their academic uh, capacity is going on. And that also limits the expenditure that is borne by the student for receiving education will be somehow challenged also. Because if the continuous, you know, uh, uh, protests are going on in the universities against uh, some particular ideologies or ideologies which are mainstream, then it can create a challenge for the organization itself or those who are donating those uh, universities. Because when the shareholders start, you know, questioning the companies that why you are doing so, then actually it can limit the funding also for those universities. So those universities also can be a major situation creator. So these are the limits and pros and cons of the university's protest. So current protest that is going on, it is regarding the US, uh, I mean, stand on the Israel ongoing conflict. Then comes the next topic and that is called Supreme Court declining petition to end collegium system and revive NJAC. So NJAC is National Judicial Appointment Commission. This particular commission was brought in in 2015 and why it was done so that you know the problems of the collagen system can be reduced problem of the collagen system included that you know all those people who are uh, in the judges 
who are in the judges seat actually they were only selecting the judges so they uh, the parliament actually you know talked about a particular system where not the brother judges but uh, there will be a particular committee who would be choosing the judges and it was to just you know bring a system which is fully transparent but the supreme court in uh, its constitution bench in 2015 abolished this particular system and said that that was ultra virus so supreme court has again said not to revive njac and has declined to end collagen system as of now uh, for more such videos you can like the button and subscribe the channel thank you